Hello, and welcome to 10 Minutes with Scripture. I'm Kyle, and today we're going to be reading the second chapter of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed. Nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless, blameless our conduct was toward you believers. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word which is also at work in you believers. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God and Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own compatriots as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out. They displease God and oppose everyone by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Thus they have constantly been filling up the measure of their sins, but God's wrath has overtaken them at last. As for us, brothers and sisters, when for a short time we were made orphans by being separated from you, in person, not in heart, we longed with great eagerness to see you face to face. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, wanted to again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Yes, you are our glory and joy. So in this chapter, we have more about the effectiveness of the gospel, and in particular, we have repeated remindings to the congregation about Paul's deep love for them, about the relationship that they had developed when they were together. And that language of reminding comes up in several verses, right at the beginning of the chapter where he says, you yourselves know that our coming was not in vain. Uh, it comes up again in verse 5, as you know, we never came with words of flattery in verse 9. You remember our labor and toil. In verse 11, as you know, once again, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children. This language of reminding is important to maintain a sense of intimacy and relationship while they are separated by distance. And really that strikes a chord with me these days as we're not able to gather together in church as one body. I'm not able to go and make the hospital visits that I would like to or see people in their homes. Um, and so I'm relying on 
other modes of communication using this video or making more phone calls in order to try to stay in touch with people. And I know that all of you are doing the same, reaching out to one another in love, making more calls to friends and family, trying to make use of new technologies to do that when we can't be together physically. And so there's encouragement in that. This is not the first time that people have been separated from their loved ones and that we can find ways to love and strengthen and encourage one another, even as we are separated by distance. So I'm reminded that when some people say they don't like Paul or they think that um, Paul is too uh, rough or aggressive, um, that Paul can be incredibly pastoral and caring, and we see no better example of that than in this first letter to the Thessalonians, that he is incredibly gentle with the community. But there is something that stands out as a little bit out of place and character with the rest of the letter, and that's these verses 14 through 16, um, where there's very harsh criticism of the Jewish community um, for the execution of Jesus, for persecution of the prophets, and for the hardship that Paul and his companions personally endured um, in their missionary work and in their travels. And once again, this language of God's wrath uh, comes up. Um, the same thing that we heard in verse 10 in the first chapter, that this has some eschatological tones to it, Some that is some um, reference to the end times, um, that people were expecting when Jesus came back again. Uh, and again, this community was expecting that to be happening soon. Uh, Paul probably didn't have any particular punishment or um, scenario in mind when he's making this reference here, although there are um, some scholars who have historically um, thought that this might be a reference to the expulsion of the Jews from Rome in 49. There was also a massacre um, at the temple in the same year, um, or when this letter has occasionally been given a much later dating, um, possibly seen as either predicting or referring to um, the fall of the temple and the sacking of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Again, Paul probably isn't referencing that in this letter or having that in mind, but is using that eschatological language, is using that end time language um, that we need Jesus to be saved from because that is what the community is expecting. It's what their faith has been placed in and how they were formed as early Christians. But then just a few verses later, um, we're going to move away from this more negative imagery um, and the sort of anti-Jewish polemic that is in these few verses to return to a message of hope and joy. Paul is saying that I desperately wanted to be back with you again. I, just like a parent, I brag and boast about you. You are my joy and you are my boasting before the Lord Jesus. This is Paul as um, the, the grandparent that's got in his wallet, the pictures of his grandkids that he can boast about and boast about to God, boast about to Jesus that this community is doing the work, that this community is on fire for God and is full of the Holy Spirit. And so it is that note of encouragement and support that Paul ends this chapter on, and it is with that note of hope and encouragement that we can take into our hearts that even as we are separated um, by social distancing at this time, we can continue to be on fire for God. We can continue to do the work that God has given us to do, to love and support and encourage one another, to remind each other of good times and remind each other of all that God has done for us in our lives. Tune in next time for chapter 3 as we continue reading Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Boop!